Hello everyone, my name is Joanna Gobrio. I am the Director of Adult Congenital Heart Disease at the Cleveland Clinic. And with me here is Dr. Josta Pedersen, who is also the Surgical Director of Adult Congenital Heart Disease at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, today's topic is going to be anomalous coronary arteries and myocardial bridges that are sometimes uh, difficult to manage and treat uh, given the different symptoms or the lack of symptoms in some of the patients that present to us in clinic. So Dr. Pedersen, maybe I can start with discussing with you um, the volume of anomalous coronary arteries that you have seen here in the clinic uh, over your time at the Cleveland Clinic. This is an increasing uh, problem and the, the general awareness of this group of patients is, uh, is increasing everywhere. And, uh, we, have, we just have a European championship in football going on and, and one of the players of a Danish team dropped dead on the field. And the first diagnosis you think about for such a patient is an anomalous left coronary artery from, from the right sinus. There are so many different kinds of, of uh, coronary abnormalities and some of them are malignant like uh, the one we just mentioned. And, some of them are benign. Some of them require surgery because blood flow to the myocardium is uh, compromised. And uh, some of them we just have to be aware of when we do surgery for other, uh, for other uh, reasons. So uh, it's a lot of things to discuss. And, and we as physicians are confused about this. And the, the number of patients that we as surgeons operate on is very low, but has been steadily increasing with this increasing awareness. Uh, we've also been confused about uh, uh, which are benign and which are uh, malignant enough to justify an operation. So there's a lot of things to uh, discuss and talk about when it uh, comes to this. And maybe to take like a step back and kind of discuss what is an anomalous coronary artery um, and what is a myocardial bridge. So an anomalous coronary artery is essentially if the coronary artery origin is not from the normal coronary cusp uh, in the aortic root, or the course of it is also abnormal. So if it courses between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Alternatively, a myocardial bridge is when the coronary artery, instead of coursing on the surface of the myocardium actually delves into the myocardium and is then covered by myocardial fibers and that can cause compression. Now, oftentimes this used to be thought of as fairly benign. However, we now know with the increasing awareness that Dr. Patterson just mentioned that they can actually be quite malignant. Anomalous coronary arteries can actually be the second most common cause of sudden cardiac arrest in athletes. And it's definitely a far more recognized cause of sudden cardiac arrest, as well as chest pain and ischemia and ventricular arrhythmias in patients that we see here at the clinic. Also with myocardial bridges, there can be the benign form where you have a shorter or a fairly shallow bridge, or if you have the longer and deeper bridges, these are far more malignant and do require um, medical management or surgical therapy in such cases. Um, so just to kind of discuss a little bit the forms of anomalous coronary arteries that we here at the clinic tend to feel are the more malignant subtype, Dr. Pedersen. Uh, you've discussed the anomalous coronary artery that is a right coronary coming from the left cusp. Um, other ones are going to be the anomalous coronary, which is a left coronary coming from the right cusp. Um, and then there's also the anomalous uh, coronary that's coming from the pulmonary artery. That is far, far more rare, and we rarely see those in adults. They're usually picked up in a uh, pediatric population, although every now and then we do tend to see some of those. But to focus on the two types that you have operated on quite uh, often are going to be the anomalous right from a left coronary cusp and an anomalous left from a right coronary cusp. Of those two, um, which ones have you thought to be more symptomatic in patients? So that is the, the left coming from the right uh, uh, cusp. And that is uh, the one that is, uh, I think, before we had sophisticated ways of deciding uh, the impact on blood flow, we it really felt that all of those should be operated. Today, we can sort of decide and maybe more uh, selective. The right from left coronary cusp is much more common. 
and uh, less malignant. And uh, there we really need uh, the new modalities to, to work those patients up to decide which are uh, malignant. The surgery is, so to say, uh, uh, fairly uh, simple and fast. And, and uh, the way we do it today is that, that these arteries has a course in the wall of the aorta. And it is in that in, intramural segment, as we call it, uh, that uh, uh, the, blood sub, the blood flow uh, gets uh, compromised. And, and they go behind the commissure, as the name says, they, they so to say, cross over a commissure. And the, the commissure is where, where two cusps of the aortic valve comes together. And uh, that say generate thickness of a wall and and my personal belief is that that's where we have the obstruction and uh, that over time the wall gets uh, thicker and uh, and uh, uh, compresses the artery even more uh, that also creates a surgical problem because if it's not going above that the commissure then we can damage the aortic valve when we operate on this so that's something we have to be aware of. And, and the, the surgery itself, uh, although simple, uh, requires some uh, that you really see what you're doing and that you dissect out these arteries and see exactly where the intramural course is and, and uh, uh, what, you, what you can unroof and what you can't. And, and if we can't unroof them, we can so sort of take the arteries uh, down and we can re-implant the artery. That's easiest for the right. For the left, we have so say other ways of, of connecting a new, uh, doing a new connection to, uh, to the aorta to relieve the, the obstruction. So we can, we can surgically handle this, but it is important that you know what you're doing and that you see some of them. And, we have probably done, so say, over 100 of these uh, now. So even if we are a big clinic, you know, I'm talking about 100s. When we talk about coronary bypass surgery, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of operations. So, the, so that puts it in some perspective how common and uncommon this is. Yeah, it is, it's a rare congenital uh, disease, obviously. And going back to symptoms, I do want to emphasize that not everybody will present with symptoms. So the common symptoms are going to be chest pain. Some people have pre-fainting symptoms or fainting. Others will have shortness of breath or fatigue. But that's only about a third of the patients will have these kind of symptoms. Sometimes it's com they're completely asymptomatic. And importantly, sometimes the first symptom is the episode of sudden cardiac arrest. And that's why when it's an incidental finding on your, let's say, CAT scan, it is important to still get an evaluation to see if this is important to treat or not. Um, and that's why sometimes we have this dilemma when we have these patients with the incidental finding on CAT scans who do not have symptoms, for example. How do we manage them? And that's where the clinic kind of has come up with a multi-modality evaluation for these patients that includes not just non-invasive testing, such as we do coronary CT to look at the course, look at the caliber of the vessel, how deep it is into the myocardium, how shallow is the bridge, how long is the bridge, the course of the anomalous coronary. We also do non-invasive stress testing, such as a stress MRI or a PET stress test with dobutamine to kind of elicit that dynamic obstruction that we see with the anomalous coronaries and the myocardial bridges. And then lastly, we do do an invasive stress test, which is the catheterization where we use a wire to measure the pressure difference across either the anomalous coronary ostium or the myocardial bridge to see is there sufficient lack of blood flow or blood flow disturbance to the heart muscle that can cause problems in the future, such as ischemia, ventricular arrhythmias, or kind of as a um, surrogate to sudden cardiac arrest as well. And we work as a team all together, including the patient and the patient family, to figure out what would be the best next step. And it makes a difference also how, what the patient does. So if the patient is, for example, a professional athlete, that makes us be a little bit more aggressive, I would say, in treating this patient because they're definitely higher risk um, versus somebody who just enjoys gardening and are not going to push themselves to the limit. 
Um, how do you feel about that kind of um, taking the patient profession into account when making a decision of whether to operate or not? It's of course uh, important how we limit uh, what the patient will be allowed to do. It's a, I think it's a big uh, thing to to restrict patients' activity, and uh, you know, particularly in kids. Even if we say that this is probably benign and your risk is very low, then if you go to a, if you are a, a gifted athlete and you go to a sports team, they will they will shy away from you, they will not allow you to play, and uh, also many physicians would be, of course, afraid of, of allowing full, act, full activity uh, because, uh, because of the risk that something happens. We really don't know, so say, how big the risk is. You know, we have these uh, super athletes who, who, uh, who have enormous performance and then suddenly they drop dead on the on the field and uh, we all uh, we see more and more of these uh, patients who uh, get symptoms as adults we find them in adults and they have lived 30 40 50 years with this why should this suddenly become uh, malignant and so so many many questions we don't know the the answers to and uh, then we have this discussion with the patients that uh, we are uncertain about what we can do and it's also very important if you if you have one of these uh, incidents for example a sudden death that you have really uh, been worked up properly so that you know what the what the underlying cause is for example we go back to the Danish player he's been advised now and given an ICD and of course, the uh, Italian professional team say, oh, you're not playing for us anymore because you have an ICD. And, and then, of course, you wonder, was he completely worked up with all aspects of this? Could this be, be this kind of anomaly that we could address surgically? Or is it uh, some kind of a muscle disease that we don't have any medical cure for? What is his long-term prognosis? There's a lot of things that that uh, these patients uh, uh, want to know and the consequences of our diagnosis is uh, of course uh, very important to outline to the patients. We also have to rem remember that no surgery is completely innocent. No surgery is completely innocent and, and uh, it is a little bit of course nerve-wracking to, to handle these uh, uh, small arteries and, and uh, every one of these operations has a potential risk of causing, uh, causing serious uh, damage and, and uh, we are so to say a tertiary center so we have seen examples of that and that's also a reason why you might want to come to a place that do many of these operations and has a this multi-specialty uh, and team approach uh, to the problem uh, so that we can really find out so say, what your risk is and also not only for you but uh, uh, also for other patients and in the future that we collect as much experience as possible and do all these examinations. We need to really uh, understand all these problems uh, better. Yeah. And as Dr. Pedersen mentioned, I mean, you have operated on a lot of my patients, including a police officer, a fireman, a marathon runner who actually had an episode of sudden cardiac arrest while running. You've also operated on grandmothers that have are very physically active and wanted to know that they're not going to be limited while caring for their children and grandchildren. So the spectrum is fairly large from the very young anything as young as 12 and 13 years old to the very old, as old as 75 actually. And you do present with different symptoms or no symptoms at different times. Um, and that's why the clinic, we're trying to actually create this long-term database and registry to monitor these patients and follow them long-term so that we have answers to the unanswered questions we have right now. Um, and that will help a lot future generations as well. In addition to this, as Dr. Pedersen mentioned, for athletes, for example, or the police officers and firemen or these professions that are more active, 
we try and actually evaluate them after surgery. And we've done this in yeah. many of the patients that Dr. Pedersen has operated on, where I repeat the stress testing that we have done before um, the surgery. And we find that there's actually resolution of this dynamic ischemia or lack of blood flow to the heart muscle. And that gives us the confidence as physicians that the surgery was a complete success. And I can let this patient go back to their physically exertional job and do it with less risk. Now, do we know for with 100% certainty? No, there's very little in medicine that has 100% certainty, but at least that gives us the reassurance mm -hmm. that there is normalization of blood flow to the heart muscle. Um, any differences of what your choice of surgery, Dr. Pedersen, between let's say an unroofing versus bypass in anomalous coronaries or mycosal bridges? There are very few uh, of these patients now where we immediately do bypass. And, and, uh, and uh, we try to sort of do uh, other procedures. Arterial bypasses with, with the arteries that last very long doesn't work very well in these patients because you know an artery, if you do bypass with an artery, that has to be promoted all the time. Otherwise, it becomes atretic. It, becomes, it uh, uh, becomes smaller, and when you need it, it doesn't work. So we, we have to take vein out of the leg if we want to do uh, bypasses with these, and, and they are more prone to to develop a disease than, uh, than arteries. So bypass is not really a good alternative. So we try to avoid that. And these, uh, say, unroofing procedures work very well. Uh, Re-implanting the artery, putting it back, giving it a, a new ostium, and, and so, of course, uh, has uh, it's technically a little bit more demanding and and uh, there's always a potential that you get scarring of the new connection and so, so you gotta be uh, careful with that. You know, no medical procedure is absolutely infallible and, and, uh, and uh, perfect. So, uh, and also the connection between these anomalies and symptoms is not always uh, clear. So, we can, that's why we don't want to operate on symptoms only. We want to have an objective mm -hmm. uh, measure that the blood supply is actually compromised by the, by the anomaly. And uh, uh, that's why we also want to see afterwards that the operation has done what we wanted it to do and what we, we, what we believed uh, it should do. We have, in essence, developed approaches to all or most variations of, of uh, these, uh, these anomalies. So we, we, uh, we have a solution. If that's the final solution and the perfect solutions, I don't know, but uh, we have an operation for, for almost uh, anything. Uh, and uh, with increasing experience, we are say, more comfortable with, with doing it. And, and uh, we have been very good in, in avoiding damaging the aortic valve, which is a concern when we do unroofing and the myocardial bridges. It, you know, when I started doing heart surgery, they were all considered benign, and, and, and it's such a common finding, so you really have a good reason for working, working them up and, and looking at them. So, but now, we operate on more and more of those uh, patients. So there are, of course, many patients out there. Yeah, I agree. And as Dr. Pedersen mentioned, which is really important, is that there's a lot of falsehood or perhaps lack of knowledge about these two entities, both the anomalous coronaries and the myocardial bridges. As Dr. Pedersen said, myocardial bridges used to be thought as completely benign. And yes, while they can be more common, and a lot of them can be benign, there is a group of them, a subgroup of them, that can actually be quite malignant. And that's why you do need that kind of more thorough evaluation. The longer, the deeper bridges can definitely be more malignant and can cause symptoms, including sudden cardiac arrest. So that's important to understand. Furthermore, as Dr. Pedersen mentioned, not everybody will come with symptoms or your symptoms might not actually be related to the anomalous coronary or the myocardial bridge. 
but it was almost a cause for you to get an evaluation and have that incidental finding that does also require further evaluation. And lastly, stress testing is not always going to be positive. Actually, in the majority of cases, stress testing will be completely normal, but that's why we do all this extra evaluation, including the invasive catheterization that we do here to kind of really elicit the ischemia or the lack of sufficient blood flow to the heart muscle. So that's why it does require multiple levels of evaluation and a, a group decision-making process to treat these patients. I'll uh, look at the questions we have here, and mm. uh, one of the questions is if, uh, if uh, these anomalies can be treated with stents. Very good question. And while there has been reports of treating both micro bridges and anomalous coronaries with stents, the results are actually rather suboptimal. One, if you think about it, there's going to be a stent in an area that has dynamic compression, so it's more prone to fracture or increased rate of uh, restenosis. So stenting in either anomalous coronaries with intramural courses or mycosal bridges, I would say, are suboptimal, and the best treatment is unroofing or surgical therapy. Yes, so I think that's an important thing. And we have actually uh, been operating on patients who yes. had previous uh, stenting. And, yeah. and one of the issue with that is not only that it doesn't work very well, it also burns bridges. Mm -hmm. So once you have done, uh, put a stent in the intramural course of the artery, you can't unroof it. Then the only option you have next time is to do a bypass. Yeah. Very true. So, so it is a bridge burning problem mm -hmm. to, do, to do that. Yeah. Yeah, hypertrophic That's... cardiomyopathy is, so to say, a different, a different, yeah. a different entity. And, and uh, I think that if you were to have a combination of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and one of these anomalies, you have to treat them as uh, separate problems. Agreed. And uh, decide uh, what needs to be done. And there's been kind of controversial scientific data of whether myocardial bridges do increase the risk in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus don't really add much to their already present risk of sudden cardiac arrest. So that's still, again, an area of unanswered questions, but it's something that we do look at in these patients as well. Um, so I hope we have answered yeah. a lot of questions for you. And uh, unfortunately for now, I think I will have to go and do the surgery. So thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Thank you all.